Okay, this video is from the book Best Christian Art that just came out a couple days ago, and we're going to do the first chapter of paintings. We'll start with the ancient Greeks. And some people say, well, why do you start with the ancient Greeks? I thought it was Christian art. And in my opinion, the ancient Greeks are part of Christianity, okay? And a lot of people would agree with that. Plato, in his writings, Platonic philosophy, had a very strong influence on Augustine. And that subsequent influence of Augustine has a very strong influence on Protestantism. Martin Luther, the beginning of Protestantism, was an Augustinian monk. On the other hand, the other school of thought in ancient Greek philosophy was Aristotelianism, Aristotle. And he had a very strong influence on St. Thomas Aquinas, which had a big influence on Catholicism. Aquinas is one of the doctors of the Catholic Church. Okay, so what I'm saying is the New Testament is written in ancient Greek. And the way we think, ancient Greece was like the first ancient civilization to really promote freedom and free thought and free discussion in a big way. Um, if you want to learn ancient, I'm going to show a whole bunch of paintings here in just one sec, but if you want to learn about the ancient Greeks, um, the best book on philosophy for ancient Greeks and modern is The Cave in the Light by Arthur Herman. Um, the best book to learn about the personality of the ancient Greeks is called The Greek Way by Edith Hamilton. It's a great book. I really like her. She's really good on the ancient Greek. She gets it. She, you know, she's fluent in Greek, fluent in Latin. Okay, the best DVD course to get started learning about the ancient Greeks is Famous Greeks by Rufus Fears. Rufus Fears is the best professor out of all the subjects, of any subject, of the greatcourses.com uh, professors. They're also called Wonderium. So Wonderium is their online version. Um, and then in the past, they used to sell mostly DVDs and audio CD courses. This is a great course, both the audio CD version and the DVD version. Okay, um, here's a quote by George Santayana, a Spanish philosopher who was a little bit connected to his Catholic background. He said, the Roman Catholic Church has much in common with Greek paganism. Christianity arose out of Greek theology and Old Testament morality. The Greek theology predominated in Catholicism. The Catholic Church has much in common with Greek paganism. Okay, uh, Old Testament morality predominated in Protestantism. Like I was saying, Platonic Augustinian. Okay, Catholic, Catholics had a Renaissance. Protestants had a Reformation. And, you know, Will Durant had said that Catholicism didn't so much replace uh, paganism as it adopted it. Okay, now we don't need to get into all that stuff that causes all these debates, but I'm just letting you know there's a very good reason why I would begin a book of Christian art with uh, Greek stuff. Okay, starting out, here's Deucalion. So Deucalion was saving his wife here from the great flood. He's lifting her up above the flood. And the reason I mention this, there's a whole bunch of ancient civilizations where they have a flood story that wiped out much of mankind. And I'm just letting you know that's in the Greeks. And the fact that all these different civilizations, you know, have a similar story indicates to me more likely it really happened, okay? So there's the painting. Uh, this one is by Paul Murwart, the Polish artist. Okay, and the way this, the life form suddenly appeared um, also, for me, is consistent with that in biology. They don't have gradual <clears throat> transformations, you know, like you would expect in Darwinian philosophy. Darwin is wrong about a lot of stuff. Okay, I, I majored in evolutionary biology in college and Darwinian biology, so I know a lot about it. Okay, anyway, here's a painting <clears throat> of Sadoc in Search of the Waters of Forgetting. It's also a painting you could consider it of Prometheus. And this is what life is like. We climb and struggle to get to the next obstacle, to get to the next obstacle. Prometheus had climbed all the way to the top of Mount Olympus to steal fire and to give it to mankind. Um, so he's one of the great heroes of mankind. In a sense, he's a Christ-like figure who sacrificed and risked his own life for the sake of uh, mankind. And this is an awesome painting. This is totally the feeling of climbing up the, a challenging achievement. Okay, that's by John Martin, the great English artist in 1812. Okay, now here's a real nice painting of Prometheus. And so Prometheus pissed off Zeus because he stole fire and gave it to mankind. Prometheus means forethought. And so Zeus punished him, chaining him to a rock, and every day an eagle would eat his liver. But it, um, Hercules saved him by shooting an arrow into the eagle. Okay, so that was good for Prometheus. Okay, here's one of the all-time beautiful paintings from the Renaissance. This is Primavera, Spring, by Sandro Botticelli, 1493. Sandro Botticelli was a favorite painter of the Medicis in Florence, Italy. The Medicis were like the richest people in Florence, Italy. And the nice thing about rich people back then is they were patrons of the arts. 
Um, there was also this idea that, you know, you, being a money lender was a sin in some way. So they tried to make up for it by funding all these good things for the public, including beautiful art. There's also another sort of saying that, oh, the Renaissance was this big movement back towards the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans and, you know, classical learning, classical mythology and whatnot. And there was to some extent, especially amongst the Medicis, but the time of the Renaissance in the 1400s, it was intensely religious, okay? It's much more Christian and religious than is widely appreciated. Okay, so anyways, magnificent painting, Primavera of the Screen, uh, The Spring by Sandro Botticelli, and you see the Greek gods all frolicking, the three graces, sort of grace and beauty. It's a magnificent painting. Okay, here's a related painting, also by Sandro Botticelli. This is the birth of Venus, and she comes in, you know, on a seashell. Uh, it's magnificent. It's just beautiful. Like I said, I think Sandro Botticelli and Rogier van der Wieden were the two best painters in the 1400s. They're both magnificent. I'll show some of his paintings in here in just a little bit. Okay, now here's a painting of Pygmalion and Galatea. So that's his statue by Jean Leon uh, Jerome, 1890. He's a French artist. <clears throat> he made a lot of great paintings. Um, you can see, you know, the little, little touches here. There's uh, Cupid in the corner there. And this is kind of the old joke of the artist falls in love with his, his model or with his sculpture. And the old joke is like for somebody teaching nutrition, they, you know, they teach the fat lady how to be skinny and she becomes all beautiful and he falls in love with her, but then she thinks she's too good for him. So it's the old joke. So anyways, nice painting. Jean Lerone, Jerome has a lot of good paintings. <clears throat> okay, here's the painting of Antigone. Antigone was the sister <clears throat> of Polynices and Etiocles who were fighting over who would rule uh, Thebes. And she's the daughter of Oedipus. You know, he's a poor, unfortunate guy who slept with his mother and um, <clears throat> uh, fathered children that way. So anyways, um, Antigone did the right thing. Basically, when they fought, um, King Creon, who then became king because Etiocles and Polynices died, he declared that uh, the body should be not buried, not receive a burial, and just left to the dogs. And she said, no, I'm not going to let that happen to my brother. So she tried to bury the body. The guards of the King Creon arrested her. And then she was imprisoned, and, and the King Creon was going to sentence her to death. But the whole thing was a crazy disaster of cascading events whereby King Creon's son was in love with her. And when she died, he committed suicide, and then King Creon's wife was so pissed off, she committed suicide too. So it all ends in a disaster. And the bottom line, King Creon was a jerk. Antigone was good. She basically said, there are laws of gods that are above the laws of men. So it was a reminder that some things are right no matter what, and no king has the right to <clears throat> overstep those. And then we kind of talk about that, the rights of the individual. So this is one thing I love about the ancient Greeks. They did have a strong sense of the rights of an individual. Now, don't get me wrong, the ancient Greeks weren't perfect. They did own slaves in a lot of areas but they were just so much better than what you'll see in the rest of the ancient world. It's not even funny. And because they traded and had a bunch of small city-states, there was a wide variety of opinions and ways of doing things. They had much of a meritocracy in society. The aristocrats maintained civilization. A lot of good things come out of ancient Greece. It's one of the most valuable things you could study if you want to study some history. I think all young people should be required to study the ancient Greeks. Okay, here's a painting called Lost Illusions about the man is sitting there and then all the women and children with their music are all having to depart. And basically, you know, we need women and kids. You know, we like having them around, all right? They got a different way of looking at the world, kind of cheers us up. Because uh, for men, life can easily become all work and no play, you know, makes Jack a dull boy, so to speak. So anyways, what's with my lighting here? I got this light here, it's a little too bright or something. So Anyways, um, I like that painting because that's kind of what it's sad, what it's like to not be around them. That's how men feel. Uh, men like women more than women like men. That's obvious. If you go to the dating site, there'll be what I've read is 85%. The men think about 85% of the women are reasonably attractive, whereas the women think only about 15% of the men are reasonably attractive. So anyways, that, that captures it right there. All right, so the next painting here is The Abduction of Europa by Zeus. So Zeus was always seducing women, and he came down to Europa, and he would often have disguises, in part because he didn't want his wife Hera to catch on to him, and as the bull Europa, he as the bull, Zeus is the bull, and he carries off Europa, and it's another beautiful painting, Jean-Baptiste Jean Pierre. France had a lot of great artists in the 1800s. 
Um, and so this is just, you know, it's a beautiful painting. The beginning of Europe. Okay, here is the Sword of Damocles. And this reminds me, you know, quote uh, Dr. Caldwell Essens, and he points out is, unless you fixed your, your diet, you know, low-fat uh, vegan diet with no oils, you're always worried about, you know, recurrent coronary artery events. There's a sword of Damocles hanging over Damocles. So the king had a servant named Damocles who said, oh, he wished he was king, he wished he was king. So Damocles, the real king, said, why don't you try it for a day? And once he tried becoming king for a little while, um, Damocles was like, oh my gosh, you know, he's worried about people taking him out and all these other problems. Uh, so it wasn't as much fun to be the king as he had thought. So that's the idea of the sword of Damocles, something major hanging over your head. And until you go low fat, low sodium, vegan, no oils, you know, you still got a significant risk of coronary artery disease if you're middle aged or older and previously ate the sad diet. So it's the smart move to go down that path. And it's a good metaphor, the sword of Damocles. Okay, here is, um, this is Perseus. So Perseus had slain Medusa, the lady who was so ugly and evil that when anybody looked at her, they turned to stone. So he couldn't look at her. He had done it with the mirror image off his shield. But he now held it out. And this is actually not that nice of a painting in the sense that this guy was his rival for a woman that he was in love with. Okay, uh, So, you know, <laughs> he used the Medusa face on his rival. Uh, but I just put the painting in there because it actually was a skillfully done painting. And so you learn the story of uh, Perseus and Medusa. And Athena was his sort of patron saint goddess, and she was supporting Perseus. And then the next thing Perseus did, another heroic event, was he saved Andromeda. And this is sort of a famous story. Andromeda was a daughter like of a king, and Perseus had, had pissed some people off. So anyways, he came in to save her and carried off you know, the damsel in distress. So that goes back before chivalry. She was being sacrificed because her father had angered Poseidon. Perseus saved her. Oh, in the original story, he wore winged shoes like Hermes, but in the painting, they often paint him on the, the Pegasus flying horse. It just works better for the painting. I love all this ancient Greek stuff. I read a couple of books on Greek mythology. I love all this stuff, and so much good stuff comes out of ancient Greece. The more you study the ancient Greeks, the more impressed you are by them, and they're so smart. You'd be amazed how smart they are, and their literature is great. Apollo pursuing Daphne. So Apollo was chasing Daphne, and she wanted nothing to do with them, and she turned herself into a tree. And there's a pretty nice sculpture of that as well. So here's a sculpture of, of, uh, of Daphne turning herself into a tree when Apollo sort of just catches up to her. I think this is Bernini's sculpture. So Bernini was the great sculptor of, like, the next generation, the 1600s. So Michelangelo was the great sculptor of the 1500s. Uh, Bernini was the great sculptor in Italy of the whole world in the 1600s. So you look at it, I mean, it's a beautiful sculpture. And this reminds you of the Apollo of Belvedere statue that uh, Pope Julius had. So it's just beautiful. The ancient Greeks were great at sculpture. Okay, Michelangelo learned a lot from them. Okay, so here's another picture of Zeus coming in like a cloud, and here he is seducing another woman. And so uh, this is Io. Zeus was always going around seducing women. And Hera, you know, try to find out about this. Zeus had all his disguises. His name, Zeus, is Jupiter <clears throat> and for the Roman gods. Okay, here is the Judgment of Paris. So the Judgment of Paris was Zeus was offered to choose who's the most beautiful woman in the world, the most beautiful goddess. You know, is it Athena? Is it Helen of Troy? Uh, or, or was it um, Venus, for example? Um, not Helen of Troy. Helen of Troy was the prize because Venus offered Helen of Troy as the prize. Paris gave her the golden apple, and that pissed off the other goddesses like Athena. And then uh, that led to the war on Troy, because once he took Helen of Troy, uh, he took her from the king of Spartan, king of Sparta. Then, um, you know, all the Greek uh, city-states aligned against Troy, and Troy fell. Okay, so Paris, unlike Zeus, was stupid enough to judge who's most beautiful amongst a couple of women. So you know whichever one you pick will be happy, but the other ones will be pissed off. So that was a naive, stupid thing for him to do. Okay, now here he is, you know, walking off with Helen of Troy. And uh, they're now calling her Helen of Sparta or Helen of Troy. The wife of King Menelaus was the king of Sparta at that time. And he's taken her to Troy. And now the Trojan War is started. And this is the mother of Achilles begging Zeus to spare her son's life. Because the fear is Achilles, even though he's a great fighter, the greatest fighter of all the Greeks, 
um, that he's going to die in this war. So she's begging Zeus to spare her son. Remember, Achilles had been dipped into the river and she held on to his heel at the time to make him, you know, invincible, but the heel was his weak spot. That's the Achilles heel. And then Achilles, Achilles initially refused to fight because he was pissed off that Agamemnon had stolen his mistress from him. But then his friend Patroclus put on Achilles' armor and went into the battle, into the fray, and he was slain by Hector, the greatest fighter amongst the Trojans. And Achilles flew into a rage. This is called the Rage of Achilles at the death of his best friend Patroclus. And because of that, he went out and he slew a bunch of Trojans and he slew Hector. And in his rage, Achilles dragged Hector behind his cart. That's part of the wrath of Achilles in front of the walls of Troy. So it was a very sort of evil, impulsive, wrong thing to do. The dead deserve their burial, but that's what he did. And you're also getting a sense the ancient Greek heroes were kind of brutal, tough guys. Like Achilles is sort of the classic all-time ancient Greek hero tough guy. Um, here is the father of Hector. He goes to Achilles and it begs him to return the body of his son, uh, which Achilles does, and he feels bad too. He kind of realizes once he's calmed down what a jerk he had behaved like. Okay. Then there's sort of a stalemate for a while, even the Troy you know, getting ahead for a while against the Greeks. And then Odysseus, the, the wisest of the ancient Greeks, had the idea to make the Trojan horse with the Greek soldiers hidden inside of there. This is a painting by Giovanni Tiepolo. Um, and that's, there's the old saying, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. In particular, Laocoon was this man from Troy who said, no, 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 don't beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Do not bring the Trojan horse into the city. It will cause great destruction. And they ignored him. Okay. And Minerva even sent some snakes to envelop him. Okay. Um, and this is a magnificent statue, Laocoon. Supposedly, Michelangelo found it in 1506 and then sold it for money. I think Michelangelo made it. There's a lot of other people who believe that as well. It's so magnificent, I think he made it. It's better than all the other Greek statues. Um, but that's also where that saying comes from, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. Okay, now here is the uh, Trojan horse inside the walls of Troy at nighttime, and you can see the Greek soldiers are climbing down out of the Trojan horse, and they're about to open the gates into Troy, and this will begin the big sack of Troy where they burn the place down and cause all kinds of havoc. But that freed up Aeneas to leave Troy and go found Rome. So here's Aeneas. He will become the founder of Rome, and he's carrying his father Anchises out of burning Troy, and there's his son with him. Okay, he's not, his wife's not able to make it. She got sick and died, and it kind of had to happen that way so that he could go on to, you know, have his romance with the Carthag Carthaginian princess Dido. Okay, um, and also this is a symbolic painting of what a man should do in his own life. He should try to carry the knowledge of his father or his forefathers and transmit it to the younger generation so that civilization can persist because... If the adults don't learn civilization so they can teach it to their children, the children never learn it, and they just become barbarians. And that, to a large extent, is what has happened in the Western world with the younger generation being, for the most part, a bunch of functional illiterates. You know, civilizations often, as Will Durant had said, is really something for the few. There's not that many people that are literate, that read, that are educated in art, literature, history, and all this stuff. But the more, the better for society to preserve itself and to be able to stand up against... Um, the dishonest types that try to destroy the society. Okay. You know, in my opinion, all schools should require teaching the Bible and American history from the founding fathers. Okay, you know, there should be, you know, a, a GW day, or his own holiday. They don't want him to have a holiday, they don't want you to know about it. Okay, Odysseus and the sirens. Okay, so when he went past the sirens, he all the men rowing the boat plugged their ears so they wouldn't hear their song, their seductive song. He had himself tied to the mast because he wanted to hear the song, but be tied to the mast so he wouldn't fall for it and do anything that he would regret. Beautiful painting by uh, this gentleman here, Herbert James Draper, 1870. Oh, here's a couple quotes about the ancient Greeks. They're pretty nice. So Goethe the German said, Of all the peoples, the ancient Greeks had the best vision of the dream for what life could be. Yeah, they were magnificent. The more you study them, the more you like them. 
Okay, and then here's Daniel Robinson, the great philosophy professor, also from thegreatcourses.com. He says, the goal of the ancient Greeks was personal perfection, not the control of others. Yes, that was a cool thing about them. Um, they don't tend to force people to think one way and only. Okay, so here is a quote. Now, this one's by Alan Bloom. Alan Bloom was a, a scholar professor of the classics at the University of Chicago, and he wrote a great book called The Closing of the American Mind. So here's an excerpt from The Closing of the American Mind. But if the schools were really to learn something of the minds of any of these non-Western cultures, which they do not, they would find that each and every one of these cultures is ethnocentric. So yeah, that's one of the things that's funny about so-called multiculturalism. You know, they'll accuse the, the Christian Americans of being, you know, self-centered, racist, ethnocentric, and all this stuff. All cultures are that way. And if you study all the other cultures, that's the point this guy's making. If you study all the other cultures, they're all ethnocentric. They all think their own way is the best way, and foreigners are dangerous or risky or whatever. Okay, so he continues. All of them think their way is the best way, and that all others are inferior. It is only in the Western nations, in other words, those influenced by Greek philosophy, where there is some willingness to doubt the identification of the good with one's own way, one's own culture's way. One should conclude from the study of non-Western cultures that not only to prefer one's own way, but to believe it the best, superior to all others, is primary and even the natural thing to do. Exactly the opposite of what is intended by requiring students to study these cultures. The reason for non-Western closedness or ethnocentrism is clear. Men must love and be loyal to their own families if they're going to, and their own people if they're going to preserve them. Yeah, you have to love Western civilization if you're going to be able to preserve it. And I'm hoping you will because as far as I can tell from studying you know, a bunch of different cultures, all the ones, the major ones that I'm aware of, it's the best hope for civilization in the world, okay? There's other cultures that might have a nice civilization. They certainly do. But they don't have widespread applicability to a large, giant population, okay? You know, the Japanese are very nice and have incredibly low rates of crime, and that's all great. But I just don't think Shintoism is going to spread throughout the United States and make it more civilized and peaceful. I just don't see that happening, okay? Whereas with Christianity, that could happen. Okay, Alan Bloom continues. Only if these people think that their own things are good will they, be, will they rest content with them. A father must prefer his child to other children. A citizen must prefer his country to others. That is why there are myths to justify these attachments. Yeah, you've got to love your country and whatever else in order to protect it. Okay, Arthur Kostler, he knows a lot about communism and he studied it. He said, but he's also knows, studied geniuses too. He said, some of the greatest discoveries consist mainly in clearing away of psychological roadblocks, which obstruct the approach to reality. That is why post factum they appear so obvious. Okay, the peasants led by Pericles built the magnificent proportioned Parthenon. Whereas the peasants, you know, led by the love of God in the Middle Ages, built the Gothic cathedrals. These Gothic cathedrals could take, you know, 50 or more years to build, so they wouldn't even live to see the thing finished, okay? And just like, you know, Pericles led to the great building of the Acropolis, the city on a hill, in a sense, Pope Julius did something magnificent and similar in the Renaissance, leading to the building of the St. Peter's Basilica, um, and then the art paintings uh, in the Stanza Signature, Raphael's School of Athens, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling. Okay, Johann Ficht. All right, so this is Bertrand Russell oh, talking about alternative psychology. I won't get into all this too much, but when I, when I write a book, I'll do this. Is I'll, I'll put quotes to space it out a little bit sometimes. But the book's got very little quotes, and it's almost all uh, paintings, okay? Uh, here's a Hilaire Balak uh, quote, early Catholic. He said, It's been discovered that with a dull urban population, all formed under a mechanical system of state education, a suggestion or command, however senseless and unreasoned, will be obeyed if sufficiently repeated. And that's been true in our society. You can get people to believe anything, go along with anything, and they just hear it a lot. You know, most people don't really have much ability to discern truth from falsehood. Okay, a lack of religion makes people weak. It makes them, when they're hedonistic, they're weak, and then they're easy to be conquered and pushed into slavery. Okay, here's a quote by Malcolm Muggeridge from Vintage Muggeridge. He's a real smart guy from England. He said, It has been said that when human beings stop believing in God, they believe in nothing. 
The truth is much worse. They believe in anything. So the final conclusion would surely be that it, whereas other civilizations had been brought down by attacks of barbarians from without, ours has the distinction of training its own destroyers at its own educational institutions and then providing them with facilities for propagating their destructive ideology far and wide, all at the public expense. Thus did modern man, modern Western man, decide to abolish himself, creating his own boredom out of his own affluence, his own vulnerability out of his own strength, his own impotence out of his own erotomania, himself blowing the trumpet that brought down the walls of his own city. And having convinced himself that he was too numerous, he labored with pill and scalpel to make himself fewer. The birth rate is going down, 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 way down. So down, it is not even uh, sustainable to where it's at. Malcolm Mulkeridge continues, Until at last, having educated himself into imbecili imbecility and polluted and drugged himself into stupid stupefaction, he killed over a weary old battered brontosaurus and became extinct. Yeah, that's where Western civilization is going right now. It's headed towards extinction. And it's a rather scary thought. Okay, continuing with a couple more paintings of the ancient Greeks. Uh, this is the Apotheosis of Homer. He's the author of The Idiot and the Oddity, The Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay, so he was magnificent. And again, Homer celebrated especially Achilles as the great physical hero of the Iliad. And then in the Odyssey, he especially celebrated Odysseus, who was more of a wise, crafty, sophisticated guy. And that was the second brand of hero amongst the ancient Greeks, more of an intelligent, thoughtful guy. And then later on, Plato came along with Plato's uh, dialogues in the Republic and whatnot, where Socrates was the hero. And Socrates was much more of an intellectual hero than was, Od was Odysseus, um, even though Odysseus certainly was a very bright guy. Now here is the Phryne before the Areopagus. Okay, so this picture is kind of self-evident and once this happened, once her, her lawyer saw that he was losing the case, and then he did this, and then all the, all the judges felt sorry for her, and she was let off. Okay, um, here is Pericles and his funeral oration um, from the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta. And this is the city that he had built, Acropolis, a city on a hill. So it's a beautiful painting, and it's rather magnificent. But he screwed up, Pericles, by pushing to have Athens fight with Sparta. They should have stayed together, and they might have maintain a strong Greece if they were unified and have been able to subsequently later on fight off the Macedonians, King Philip and whatnot. And you see this pattern over and over. When you have a country where all the city-states are remaining independent of each other and not unified, then they get taken over by an outsider. That's just like Italy around the time of the Renaissance was being pushed around by France because France had a big national army, whereas Italy was separate self, uh, little city-states like Rome was fighting with Florence and fighting with Milan, for example, in Venice. Okay, um, Pericles' funeral oration. This is uh, the death of Socrates. And Socrates is also a little bit of a Christ-like feature. He sort of gave his life for truth and philosophy. He's the saint of philosophy. And there's a beautiful painting by Jacques-Louis David since 1787. And Jacques-Louis David is sort of the star, greatest painter of the neoclassical style. Um, and it's beautiful. And Socrates you know, said, I'd rather go telling the truth and maintaining high standards of philosophy. Here's Plato, who loved him, you know, is the greatest man in Athens. And he says, what kind of a society kills its greatest man? And so that's why Plato lost respect for uh, Athens at that time. But it wasn't really the same Athens of Pericles in the sense that after the they had lost to Sparta, they had a little bit of puppets controlling things, and they were sort of de-intellectualized a bit. Uh, but still, it's a magnificent painting. Oh, well, here's one quote by Socrates. The purpose of philosophy is to determine how we ought to live. In order to decide how to live well, we have to learn what is good for us and what is bad for us. Yeah, so you do the good stuff, avoid the bad stuff. Okay, here's a painting of Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great here being introduced to, I'm sorry, Alexander the Great being introduced to Aristotle. Here's Alexander the Great when he's a teenager, or a kid to teenager, and here's Aristotle, the smartest man in the whole world, perhaps the smartest man who ever lived. And he taught Alexander the Great a little bit. But Alexander the Great was the son of King Philip of Macedon who had conquered Greece. But, you know, King Philip and Alexander the Great were kind of barbarians, you know, compared to Aristotle, who was this philosophic biologist genius. 
but they were friends. And uh, later on, when Alexander would conquer a country, he would send biologic specimens back to uh, Aristotle to classify. Again, he was the early big biologist. Oh, and here's a funny painting of, uh, let me get it a little higher, a funny painting of Aristotle and Phyllis. So the story of Aristotle and Phyllis is that, again, he was the teacher of Alexander the Great. Phyllis was the girlfriend of Alexander the Great. And the soldiers were getting pissed off that they thought Philip was having, uh, Phyllis was having a corrupting influence on Aristotle. And they felt that he should break up with her. And they kept you know, pushing that line of thought to Aristotle and told him to talk to Alexander the Great, who could be influenced by him, and have him tell, Aristotle tell Alexander the Great to break up with her. And apparently Aristotle did, and then she was very pissed off at it, about it. She wanted to get revenge on Aristotle, so she flirted with him, and he got him to kind of fall in love with her or in lust with her. And then I'll show you, there's another drawing of it that tells the story a little bit better. And in this one, you can see that she told Alexander to hide behind a tree and to watch. And then she got Aristotle, who was now kind of falling for her big time, to get down on his knees and she could ride him like a horse while she pulled his hair and spanked his bottom. And what's the point of this silly picture? The point of it is that even the smartest and the man in the world can often easily be tricked by an attractive woman. So men have to be very careful about that. Uh, this is just a painting of Aristotle, greatest of all the Greeks. Okay, a couple quotes of Aristotle. He classified all the knowledge in the world of his time. He was an incredible genius. The highest activity, this is Aristotle quote, the highest activity of man is the pursuit of truth. The life of the intellect is the most pleasant and the best life because the intellect is that which is most unique about man. He even said that it is the most godlike, so philosophers, in his opinion, were the most godlike. Of course, the scholars always pick their own profession as being the most godlike and the best. Aristotle continues, The greatest of all pleasures is the pleasure of learning. The pleasure of contemplation of truth is continuous and enduring. It does not wax and wane like the other pleasures. The greatest thing is to be the master of metaphor. It is a mark of genius to be good with metaphors. It is the one thing that cannot be learned from others because to be good with metaphors indicates a deep understanding of the likeness of things. Ordinary words convey only what we already know. It is from a metaphor that we can best get hold of something new. Okay, so then here's a painting of uh, Thomas Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas. And he's looking up at the cross of Christ. He has a vision of Aquinas. And he was a, the one who had sort of unified Aristotelianism with Catholicism. And also what he did more than that was show that faith and reason go together. And actually, the modern scientific method came out of Catholicism. Um, that's an important point, because you'll hear a lot of superficial dilettantes and BS artists try to say that religion and science don't go together. And that's absolutely wrong. Re good science comes from Catholic religion. If you study history, you will see that that is true. Um, and well, anyways, Aquinas was going before Christ, and he said, you know, I've tried. If I, re I really feel like I should have done more. And God said, hey, you did good. All right. So I, I like Thomas Aquinas. I like that idea of trying to reconcile religion and science. And like I said, too, the only thing that could save healthcare and the only thing that could save the United States of America country is to go back to Bible ethics, that man is created in the image of God and therefore part divine as well as part beast and thus entitled to high consideration because there's so much more money to make, like open heart surgery, 150000 bucks total billing fees. Coronary artery stand, about $30,000. You know, teach somebody a vegan diet, Nothing, or at the most, a thousand, two thousand bucks. So the point is, whenever, unless you believe that mankind is super important, the individual, there's just too much money to be made by ripping them off and drugging them and surgerizing them. That it's always going to be that way. So that's why you have to have those types of religious ethics, or you can't have good health care. And it doesn't matter how much technology, how much money you spend, it's always going to be focused on ripping people off uh, un unless that changes. Believe me, I spent a long time thinking about that. Okay. <clears throat> Aquinas taught that faith and reason are not in opposition, but they're actually complementary. Okay. Uh, let's see. Christianity taught that all human beings are invited into a personal relationship with God and that all individuals are equal in God's eyes, regardless of their earthly station. It is a theology that empowered the individual acting as an individual 
as no other philosophy or religion has ever done. This message was realized more completely in one part of Christendom, the Catholic West, than in the Orthodox East. The crucial difference was that the Roman Catholicism developed a philosophical and artistic humanism that was typified and to a great degree engendered by Thomas Aquinas. He died in 1274. Aquinas made the case, eventually adopted by the Catholic Church, that human intelligence is a gift from God and that to apply human intelligence to understanding the world is not an affront to God, but rather is pleasing to God. Aquinas taught faith and reason are complementary. So that's from Charles Murray from the book Human Accomplishment. And that's totally true. And Aristotle brings individuality, individualism to society. Um, it's a magnificent thing. Okay, now here's another painting, one of the greatest paintings of all time. This painting is the School of Athens by Raphael, commissioned by Pope Julius in 1511, and it's located in the Vatican, actually in the Stanza Signatura. And there is Aristotle on the one side, and there is um, Plato right next to him. Plato's pointing up to the forms in the sky. Aristotle's pointing, pointing down to the earth, saying, be more sensible and practical, applied to real life. I love this painting so much, I have a big poster of it in my bathroom. Okay, that's how much I love this painting. And it kind of unifies all the Greek philosophers, scholars, and scientists with um, Roman architecture, all the arches and the statues and whatnot. And then Raphael was so impressed by the Sistine Chapel ceiling, he painted Michelangelo into this painting. And uh, Ayn Rand loves Aristotle as well. Uh, here's a quote by her. If there is a philosophical atlas who carries the whole of Western civilization on his shoulders, it is Aristotle. Whatever intellectual progress men have achieved rests on his achievements. Aristotle may be regarded as the cultural barometer of Western history. Whenever his influence has dominated the scene, it paved the way for one of the brilliant eras. Whenever Aristotle's influence fell, so did mankind. Aristotle is the father of individualism. Yep, that is true. Will Durant said that the School of Athens painting by Raphael is the apex of the Renaissance. That is true. It's magnificent. It's stunning. Whereas you know, the creation of Adam by Michelangelo is the greatest painting that ever existed. That has more of a religious and a philosophical significance. Whereas for the Renaissance, the School of Athens is it. Okay, here is uh, St. Paul preaching in Athens at the Areopagus. And, um, you know, let's say he's preaching the, the, the writings from 1 Corinthians. St. Paul, if I speak in tongues of men and, angle, men and angels but have not love... I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all that could move mountains, but have not love, then I am nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it does rejoice with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. For we know now in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. What I now know in part, then I shall know fully. So abide by these three, faith, hope and love, and the greatest of these is love. So that's kind of making the message is without love, things don't go so well, even if you got all the other stuff. And that's what I'm saying about healthcare. Healthcare does not love the patients. The big money players who run healthcare, they don't like the patients. They hate them. They just want to rip them off and take advantage of them. And that's why healthcare, despite all the training of all the doctors, nurses, nurse assistants, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, etc., despite all the technology, all the money spent on it, it's really pretty lousy in America. The results are, are terrible. And, and, and that's why, because it lacks this love. And, you know, because you don't get paid to teach and help the patient. You only get paid to drug them and to surgerize them. So anyways, 1 Corinthians uh, is a great section from the Bible. Okay, so that's the end of this chapter. Next one will be Old Testament. I hope that was interesting for you.